Hi, Professor. You can start the presentation. Yes. I go. Yes. Oh, all right. Um, so uh, somebody tell me, uh, did you hear this description of Beschbach residents? Hello? Hi, Professor, can you repeat this? Yes, I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah, so um, did you hear this description of the Feshbach residents? I think so. You can continue from them. Okay. Randy? Yes. Yeah. Maybe it would be great if you could just uh, start from the slide before, just so everybody follows. Can you do that? Okay. Th Thanks. This one? Yeah. Okay. So did you did you miss this one? Really? Not really, but I don't know. Somebody wants to hear it again, or shall we go to okay. the flashback? All right, no okay. problem. Go for the next. So, then. okay. All right. Let me uh, let me just start here and and pick up where I left off. So, uh, Gustavo, do you want me to finish by eleven? Uh, I I don't think you need to be so sharp, but go if you can do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So I will do my best to finish on time. Sure. Okay. So um, this, uh, these images on the left show uh, a Bose condensate emerging from uh, a cloud of thermal atoms. And if uh, it gets overfilled to the point where um, it becomes unstable to collapse, then that uh, condensate suddenly disappears. And uh, so we see this alternating cycle of growth followed by collapse of the condensate, which uh, some people have called the Bosa Nova. Um, so uh, how do we tune interactions? We can use this Feshbach resonance in which a scattering or open channel of two atoms that are spin polarized um, uh, because of hyperfine uh, interaction mix with spin, the spin singlet channel where the total uh, spin, electronic spin quantum number is equal to zero. So in that case, there's bound states of these two potentials. And those bound states can be magnetically tuned into or out of resonance. And when you do that, the scattering length as you go through resonance will diverge, first from the negative side, then to the positive side. And so the magnetic field serves as a control knob in which to tune the strength and sign of the interaction. So this is an example of the ground state of lithium-7. Um, these are called hyperfine sublevels, and they have to do with the interaction of the nuclear spin with the electronic spin. And uh, uh, this, I've indicated in red, two of the states that we've used experimentally in the experiments that I'll describe going forward. There's the 2-2 state. That's what we used on our original BEC experiment. Um, it's not tunable by a magnetic field because it's fully spin polarized and there's no mixing between spin singlet, spin triplet. But for the 1-1 one -one state, this is uh, M sub, um, this is F equal one, M sub F equal one. These are the total electronic quantum numbers. Um, that lower red one is tunable by magnetic field as shown here. So this is the S wave scattering length that I discussed previously. And you can see by going through this resonance condition, I can make the scattering length essentially infinite and positive or infinite and negative as I go away from that magnetic field, the scattering length decreases in magnitude. 
The one thing which is interesting about this particular Feshbach resonance is that there's a zero crossing, which is very shallow. So at this field, the scattering length is essentially zero, which means that the closed condensate is an ideal gas at that value of scattering length. And more importantly than an ideal gas for us is to be able to make the scattering length attractive or negative, uh, but very weak, so very small in numerical value. So that occurs just to the um, low field side of this zero crossing so over in here. Okay, so that's my introduction to quantum gases. Let me talk now about uh, solitons. So solitons are ubiquitous anytime you have nonlinear wave physics. So they show up in a multitude of, of settings, uh, including um, this is a picture in Australia, I believe, of, of a cloud formation in which these are these cloud formations are effectively uh, solitons and uh, not quantum solitons, but classical solitons. And I'll talk about uh, soliton collisions in experiment in our group and also the dynamics of soliton trains. So uh, often these observations of matter wave solitons results in not just one soliton, but a train of solitons. And that's what's indicated here and, and here. All right, so um, solitons are the solution of the so-called nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So this should, equation should look familiar to you except for maybe this interaction term, which scales by the density. And that interaction term we've seen before, it's the mean field interaction strength. And so um, if you multiply that times the density, you get an interaction and you get an interaction which is either attractive if G is negative or positive, uh, it will be repulsive. And uh, for the negative case, the attractive case, you can get into a regime where wave packet dispersion, uh, omega of K, the function of omega of K, um, we usually uh, know that um, in such a dispersion relation that there is um, omega is a function of K and the wave packet spreads but you can compensate for this wave packet dispersion by this nonlinear interaction term. And so if it's attractive, this term, it will compensate for the tendency of the wave packet to spread. So usually, you know, we think about um, in uh, wave packets that are localized in, qu in quantum mechanics, but also in classical wave physics, that over time, the wave packet will disperse. But it's possible to, by this term being negative, it's possible to compensate for dispersion and have a wave packet which propagates without spreading or losing uh, amplitude. So these uh, wave, this wave phenomena in which this occurs are called solitons. And uh, as I said, their solitons are well known going back to um, a canal in Scotland in uh, the 1830s, so almost 200 years ago, um, a, uh, a physicist noted that uh, boats, the bow wave from a boat um, propagated down this canal for many, many kilometers without wave packets spreading or dispersion. That's been seen in optics. This is a photorefractive crystal. Um, as I mentioned, these cloud formations. And, uh, and also perhaps uh, people have speculated that uh, nerve impulses uh, have to do with propagation of, sol of soliton or solitary waves that propagate along these, uh, along these uh, uh, neurons. So um, this phenomena of solitons and non-spreading wave packets is ubiquitous. It means that we see it everywhere. 
And when you start looking, you see, you find more and more examples of solitons physics. And matter wave solitons are just one manifestation of this phenomena, but a very interesting one. So this is again our Feshbach resonance in lithium seven that I showed before, theoretically. Um, and now this is the uh, experimental realization of that. This is the scattering length versus magnetic field on a log scale. And you can see here that we're going like six orders of magnitude in strength of this S wave interaction by varying this magnetic field all the way from the resonance field to um, low field where the uh, eventually at low enough field, the scattering length changes sign and goes from undergoes a zero crossing, which is shown in this inset. So as we come down in very small scattering lengths, these are uh, scattering lengths are given a unit of a bore radius. So something like five times 10 to the minus nine uh, centimeters. Um, when it undergoes a zero crossing, um, the scattering length changes sign from being weakly positive to weakly attractive. And this is the ideal place to look for soliton. So the wave function that um, is very spread out due to repulsive interactions near the Feshbach resonance is now become very small near uh, on the other side of the zero crossing. And this, uh, and this is the manifestation of that wave packet being one of these non-dispersing functions called a soliton. So you can expand the soliton into a one-dimensional trap uh, by um, creating a trap using focus beams of infrared uh, light that uh, form by crossing them form a more or less uh, close to spherically symmetric potential. But if you remove one of these beams, this cross beam, potential becomes very elongated along this one dimensional axis. And so the aspect ratio goes from near spherical in this case to being highly elongated in this case. And so um, if we suddenly, if we do that experiment, suddenly releasing the atoms into this one dimensional guide, then we see that they don't disperse in uh, great contrast to the repulsive case where uh, dispersion is fully allowed and uh, happens very quickly. So this is, uh, you know, I think a very graphic demonstration of the non-dispersing aspect of a soliton wave packet in time. This is time that progresses vertically on this plot. All right, so it's uh, stable um, in quasi 1D as long as the total number of atoms is less than this ratio of the harmonic oscillator scale length along the radial direction, transverse direction to this guide, uh, compared to the magnitude of the S-wave scattering length. There should be an absolute magnitude sign here. So when this quantity NC, when N is less than NC, the soliton is stable against collapse. Uh, but when N exceeds NC, it, it will suddenly undergo uh, a catastrophic collapse and the soliton will disappear. So how does that work? So um, in fact, this image shows two solitons colliding and time again is vertical on this axis. And this is position on the lower axis. When they collide, they, uh, in this example, they've collided with enough atoms that um, the total number of atoms exceeds the critical density and they uh, undergo collapse. And so this is an example of um, the kind of physics that I described earlier of the 
the growth and collapse of the Bose-Einstein peak in, from a thermal cloud. This is the same exact physics that's happening here. So how do we form a soliton pair to do this, to do a collision experiment? Well, we start by forming a repulsive BEC way up here where this red arrow is. So the scattering length's big and positive. And we can do what's called evaporative cooling to uh, cool the gas below its transition temperature. Then we turn on a barrier, which is crossing a cylindrically focused sheet of light, which is crossing the Z axis in such a way that it splits the condensate into two pieces. And I think it's best to look at this image where you can see the effect of that cross cylindrically focused, very tightly focused beam along this Z axis, along the axis of the one dimensional waveguide. And then we ramp the magnetic field. That's turning on the barrier. And that's done up here where the scattering length's big and positive. Then we ramp the magnetic field to where it's small and negative. And uh, now we refer to the inset. And you can see we can make the scattering length to be something like minus 0.57 bore. And then we quickly turn the barrier off. And once we turn the barrier off, the barrier was holding these two solitons apart, these two separately created Bose-Einstein condensates. Um, now they can suddenly, when you turn the barrier off, they suddenly fall towards one another. And at some later time, they will be on top of each other and collide. So that's what's shown, shown here. There's a, um, this is time going along the vertical axis in periods of the harmonic potential along the Z axis. And this is the, uh, the Z axis, which is the axis of the one dimensional waveguide. So at T equals zero, these two solitons are held apart by, you can see something like 30 microns or so. And then we turn that uh, barrier off and allow the solitons to fall down that potential well and collide after a quarter of a period so these two mass lumps, these two solitons collide at this point, and then they pass through one another because it turns out that they're solutions of an integrable equation, which is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And because it's integrable, there are uh, conserved quantities. And one of them tells us that the soliton is not going to change shape or speed or um, amplitude. And so um, they don't. And they pass through one another and they come back and they do it again after uh, three quarters of a period of this oscillator. And then they, they do this ad infinitum. They keep going back and forth. That corresponds to a relative phase of the two solitons, which is zero. So how do I know that? Well, if I look at this image where the two solitons are on top of one another, if their relative phase is zero, they'll constructively add. And you can see this one Gaussian peak. But this is an example of where the relative phase between the two solitons was created in an anti-symmetric way. And when they collide, there's a node in the center rather than a peak. So instead of having a single soliton, there's a, um, or a single density peak. The density is split uh, due to this destructive interference, which occurs when the relative phase is pi. In both times, both collisions, you can see that difference. There's a node here and a node here for this case, but in the opposite case, when they're in phase, there's an anti-node and an anti-node. So that's just the symmetry of the wave function. And I think it's a kind of a nice demonstration of the single wave function that a Bose condensate um, has. 
and there are simulations of these from simulating the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. This is by uh, Parker, Martin, Cornish, and Adams. So this is uh, the pi phase shift where there's a, a node between them. And this is the, uh, uh, the when the phase shift is equal to zero, the difference in phase between the two solitons is zero, there's an anti-node. All right, so integrability tells us the solitons must pass through one another. And uh, that's shown here in the solution of nonlinear Schrodinger equation, showing this dynamics. It's hard to see that they pass through one another. But indeed, I'll show you an experiment which proves that they do. So we have these two lumps that are coming down this harmonic well. When they get to the bottom of it, they undergo an in-phase, in this case, an in-phase collision in which the phase difference between these two solitons is zero. And there's a anti-node in the center. Now, if we go to the opposite case where the phase shift is pi, there's a node in the center. You see the difference? Look again, they come together, there's a zero, the wave function is zero in the center. And that's very different from the in-phase collision. Okay. So do they actually cross? So from those solutions to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, it's really impossible to tell. But we did an experiment where we made the two sides of these two different solitons that are going to collide, we made one of them weaker than the other. So we've tuned a near resonant laser beam on this left side when they're created at t equals zero and removed some of the atoms from that soliton. And then we allowed them to interact by releasing them in this one-dimensional guide. And if you follow the course behavior, you can see that the big soliton, which started on the right, undergoes a collision with a, uh, a relative phase of pi. There's a node here after this collision. They go through one another and the big soliton emerges on now on the left side. So it started on the right side, it emerges on the left side, and it comes back and it does that again. So this uh, proves that even though there is a zero in the wave function, there's a node in the center, the two solitons do indeed pass through one another as predicted by the fact that these are solutions of an integrable equation. So the relative phase of pi indicates that the solitons appear to repel each other because they never have, uh, the, the density between them is, is zero, but in fact, they do pass through one another as you can see from this experiment. All right, so another uh, case is um, where the two solitons, as I mentioned before, come together and their total number exceeds the critical number. And beyond that first collision, they disappear. So the two solitons have annihilated each other. If we go to another example, this we've seen a few occasions where this situation happens. The two solitons um, interact after a quarter of a period, and then they uh, seem to merge in some way. Um, so this is a again a an effect which is which is occurs when the total number is close to this critical number, and they merge and they uh, stop oscillating. So there's some very interesting behavior that one can see, uh, but let me go on now and talk 
about the final subject, which is the dynamics of soliton train. So when we first did this experiment a long time ago now, we quenched the energy. We quenched the, uh, the energy by changing the scattering length suddenly from being positive to negative. And when we did that experiment, we, saw, we expected to see a single soliton develop to emerge from that quench, but rather we saw a soliton train. So this is the one dimensional waveguide along this blue path. And these are peaks in density corresponding to different solitons from the same Bose-Einstein condensate. So um, this is more specifically what happens. We uh, start at small times with uh, two, uh, we start with a quenched condensate in which we form not a single soliton, but this train of solitons. And as they go through the center line, this is now at a quarter of a, of a period later, um, as we go through this quarter of a period, um, they seem to repel each other. And then they come back out the other side and they're uh, the ones that were on the lower side of the potential. That one seems to correspond to this one. And the ones that were on the higher side of the potential remain on the higher side of the potential. That's contrary to what we expect to see for the non-interacting case. If you just had two non-interacting balls, the, the one with more potential energy, the yellow one, would pass through at the bottom of its oscillation cycle, would pass through the other one, the lower one, the red one. And the yellow one would start on the left side being at the largest amplitude and finish on the right side of being at the largest amplitude. But that's not at all what we see. We see that they, they don't cross themselves. So what's going on with that? Well, apparently this is something called, this, people have seen this before in the context of optical solitons. It's called the Gordon House effect in which the interactions between out of phase solitons um, repel one another, are repulsive. And so um, we uh, surmise that when we create the, the soliton train, that the soliton train is constructed from an alternating phase structure where um, adjacent solitons have a phase difference of pi. So uh, if a soliton has a phase of pi and the one next to it on the left and the right side have a phase difference of zero, this pi a uh, soliton will repel that one and repel this one. And we get a picture that looks kind of like this. So from these observations, we can conclude that this phase structure must emerge from the quench of the interactions going from a positive repulsive scattering like condensate to a uh, attractively interacting um, Bose Einstein condensate, which forms solitons. So, the question we had then was are the soliton trains born this way, or um, does this behavior develop over time? So, we did some experiments to uh, understand how soliton trains are uh, emerge from this interaction quench. And this turns out to be described by something called the modulational instability. And uh, if we take the Schrodinger equation and we suddenly uh, quench uh, this parameter G, suddenly make it um, something different at T equals zero, then there's a certain exponential growth of a certain wavelength that uh, the wavelength is some characteristic wavelength of the system. And this process of modulational instability is seen in in many wave contexts, including plasmas and optical fibers and self-bound quantum droplets that people have done with Bose-Einstein condensates recently, and also in deep water waves. 
um, something called the Benjamin fear instability that leads to something called rogue waves, where all of a sudden, you know, ships have been sunk by water waves that have grown to be enormous heights. And uh, it seems to be the process described here by this modulational instability. So this is a, a Japanese drawing of a tsunami that uh, this, this wave is, is singular. It's just it's a single wave, might be otherwise very calm seas, might be very little wind uh, on the ocean, but all of a sudden this wave self develops and uh, can cause catastrophic damage. So this Toliton train is formed by this process of modulational instability, where there's a exponential growth of a particular characteristic wavelength. And this characteristic wavelength is uh, governed by what's called the healing length. It's the size of the vortex core. If you were to stir a kind of thing, give it angular momentum. And there's also some characteristic rate in which um, which is important. The characteristic rate is related to the characteristic length scale, which I call C, this parameter. So, so what happens, so I start at T, at T equals zero with a positive scattering length, a repulsive interaction. And I suddenly switch the sign of the interactions from being repulsive to being attractive. And on this time scale, governed by this characteristic rate, I begin to develop a periodic structure. This is the modulational instability that's doing this. And at long times, that periodic structure becomes well-established. So this is a cartoon. And um, the way I do the experiment, um, the way I do the experiment is to uh, have very talented people in the lab do the experiments. I don't actually do experiments anymore. Um, that's, you get to be my age, you're no longer entitled to have that kind of fun. So um, the way we uh, quench the scattering length is to use the Peshbach resonance, where we start with a positive scattering length of something like three bore, which is up here, and then suddenly quench it to something around um, minus 0.54. That quench happens on a time scale of about a millisecond. So this is what happens. So um, start out with this condensate, which is elongated in the one-dimensional guide due to the repulsive interactions. Suddenly make the interactions attractive and the condensate begins to develop the structure. And so after a long time, I see a soliton train develop, in which there are 11 individual solitons that uh, in this particular example that have emerged. So um, if I increase the attractive interactions even further, I can change the characteristic wavelength, make it much shorter. The wavelength depends on this parameter, this final S wave scattering length. And the time scale also changes. So here I'm looking at a development of the soliton train after a few milliseconds, whereas over here it took a few, took about 10 milliseconds to develop. And that time scale is just this ratio of this S wave scattering length. So this is the number of solitons that are created as a function of the final scattering length, the final negative value of the scattering length. And up until here, it continues, the number continues to grow, governed by the size of the condensate, the initial size divided by this characteristic wavelength, gives us a, a value, an estimate of the number, which fits pretty well until, until the quench time becomes comparable to this characteristic time scale uh, given by modulational instability. So let me finish, I, I, I run over um, and, uh, and we've been delayed because of the, some technical issues. So let me just finish up quickly. 
So um, in conclusion, integrability is very important in describing the salt on behavior uh, because of conserved quantities in uh, equations that are integrable. And there are very few examples in physics of integrable equations, but one dimensional uh, point interactions, um, something called the Yang Godin model, is one example of an integrable uh, equation. Nonlinear Schrodinger equation is, is an example of that for S wave scattering length of some particular value. So this modulational instability length and time scales were verified in the experiment I just sh shown you. A soliton train is born with this alternating phase, phase structure. And that uh, is a consequence of the process in which the soliton train is, emerges from, which is modulational instability. Um, we've also done an experiment on uh, soliton breathers and uh, that was published last year, end of, end of 2020. And uh, with Vanderlei, um, uh, we've done some experiments on modulation of the scattering length in which we produce something called Faraday waves and granulation. And this has uh, been a very fun collaboration. I look forward to continue uh, working with Vanderlei uh, in the future. So let me uh, just acknowledge the people who did this particular experiment. Um, it was done by Jason Wynn, who was a uh, research scientist in my group, and Henry Luo, who was a senior graduate student at the time. So uh, that's all for this morning. Um, later this morning, I'll talk about quantum magnetism of uh, ultra-cold fermions. So thank you. Anybody still there? <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Rondo. My pleasure. Um, I see no questions here on the internet, on the uh, YouTube, but I do believe we do have questions here from the audience. Please don't be shy. I don't think there will be any bl blackout. Please come over, it's better so you get on, on the film, Vanderly. Hi, Randy. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, my question is, uh, when the two solitons collide, you know, why don't we see a huge amount of sound waves propagating to the condensate? Why they collide, and uh, from the picture I see quite going away, and uh, I was expecting a big disturbance and a lot of uh, sound wave appearing. Why that doesn't happen? Yeah, a couple of reasons. That's a great question. Um, the scattering length is tiny. So the mean field, the density times the scattering length is a very, very small number in these experiments. The uh, scattering length is less than one bore in magnitude. And so the interaction is just very weak. And so there's, uh, there's no sound waves that are that are uh, observed in the experiment. Um, and, uh, and, and there's also the integrability. So um, to the lowest order, there is no, no loss described in, these, in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And there's no radiation uh, predicted or observed due to the weakness of, of the interaction. Now, there is another effect. Um, which is kind of related. Um, when the two solitons interact with each other, uh, there's a, um, the, the frequency in which they're oscillating in the harmonic trap can, can change due to that interaction as the two clouds pass through one another. So as they pass through the one of them will, uh, the, the solitons will be accelerated as they go through and that acceleration causes an increase, an effective increase in the harmonic frequency of the, of the oscillation. Okay, thank you. Please come over. We have more questions. <laughs> 
Hi, Randall. Uh, my name Hi. is Bruno. Uh, when you were talking about tagged collisions, you said that we, we make one solid tone weaker than the other. And I didn't understand what exactly is when you construct any, uh, one weaker, one solid tone weaker than the other. Can you talk more yeah, about Yeah, good that? question. So let me back up. In this experiment, I think you're referring to this. Um, yes. So yeah. this, uh, the two solitons have different uh, amplitudes. And the way we do this experimentally is that we remove some of the atoms from the left soliton. And so that it's distinctly different from the right one. And so um, by doing that, we can experimentally show that the bigger soliton, the one with more atoms, um, definitely passes through to the, from the right side to the left side. And as it oscillates, it goes again from the left side back to the right side. Um, and that is um, showing us that even though there is a node between these two solitons due to the relative phase being pi, um, which we, in fact, I should mention, we don't know in advance. We have to determine the relative phase by looking at this image to see if there's a, a node or an anti-node here or something in between. Um, uh, but you can see that this bigger soliton passed through the, the smaller soliton and uh, showing that uh, contrary to maybe what this image looks like, it's not so obvious that when you look at this, that the two solitons are, are really passing through one another when you look at this, this simulation. So let's look again. So given that they're equal in size, can you say whether they pass through each other or they bounced off of each other? So the fact that they have this node in the center seems to suggest that, you know, they don't pass through one another. They, they, they reflect rather than transmit. Um, but what the experiment shows is that, no, that's not correct. That our intuition about this is, is incorrect that the two solitons are really still passing through one another, even though they have a node, um, when they collide, the wave function is zero. Does that make sense? Yes, I can see he's waving back. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, Randy, we have one online question here from Sanjay Shukla. Um, instead of a 1D system, I guess he's thinking about a 2D in the case of you have two solitons rotating about an axis and if they merge after some time, would it be possible to see the quantized vortices at the final stage? Hmm. So, um, uh, that's, <laughs> that's a great question. And uh, I can speculate, I don't know the answer to the question. Um, but uh, if two solitons were rotating with respect to each other um, and, they, and they merge, um, the question is whether I guess the, vort the vorticity increases by a factor of two collectively, or they could perhaps uh, collapse due to the fact that uh, the numbers uh, will be twice as great and uh, could exceed the critical number for collapse. So that's always, um, you know, that, all, that process can always happen. So one has to do these experiments below the critical number when the two solitons merge um, or when they, you know, interact with one another because otherwise, uh, the, uh, the solitons disappear. So, um, yeah, so that, that's a really interesting question and I, I really don't know the answer to it. Sure, thank you anyway. Um, <clears throat> any more questions? 
Arnaldo, please come over. Hi, Randy. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, glad to see you. Hope to see you next time presently. So, Me too. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering about uh, this, uh, the way you, you make this uh, train of vortices. I remember some discussion with you uh, maybe two or uh, maybe three years ago that there was a problem of how many atoms are lost in this process. That you said there are something like 300,000 atoms you lose in this process of creating the train of vortices. But there was a puzzle about uh, how to predict this number. Is this problem solved or uh, there is anyone trying to understand the number of atoms that were lost in this process of creating the train of solid ones? Is, is this Arnaldo? Yeah. Hi, Arnaldo. It's great to Hi. see you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Arnaldo and I are old friends. It's been a long yeah. time. Yeah. Good time. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, uh, so you're asking um, about the, the loss of atoms in the formation of a soliton train right. by modulational instability. I think it has to do with the, this um, idea that the, the soliton train is created with this alternating phase structure. Let's see if I can pull that back up. Um, so from this picture, this, this cartoon in the bottom, where there's a zero pi, zero pi phase structure, um, requires, I believe, uh, some loss of atoms to establish itself. So in other words, uh, the, the soliton train may have maybe formed with random relative phases, but evolves into uh, having a phase structure that looks like this. And if it evolved into this kind of a phase structure, then the soliton, adjacent soliton to have the same phase um, could annihilate each other which would cause a loss. So that's, um, people have looked at that before, um, but I don't think there's any conclusive theory about how this modulational instability results in this kind of a phase structure that we, you know, that we definitely see experimentally. So I think that that's a great theoretical project. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. How or why it evolves to this, this form is some, uh, Minimal yeah. energy is some process that uh, make it go to this uh, phase structure. I yeah, I don't know if there I is anyone so. that solved this problem. I think it's an open question. Also, how why it goes exactly to this form, and why and how much atoms are lost. I don't think there is any simulation yet. On when you start with a, a bunch of atoms and you turn. How much exactly you, how much atoms you lose exactly? I, I don't think uh, it's a non-trivial, completely non-trivial calculation, even numerically, even because you must do it 3D, and uh, it's it's a really hard calculation. Uh, I don't think anyone have solved it yet. And uh, as I see asking you, I don't see uh, uh, anyone have solved uh, the number. I don't. I never seen a plot of the number of atom lost, a theoretical plot of the number of atom lost in this uh, process. Okay. I, I agree. I think the, the process of modulational instability in the context of matter wave solitons, which have this feature of having a, a maximum critical number is something that has that yet been accomplished. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arnaldo. Well, we are uh, uh, over time, time flies, and we need to finish the session, okay? So let's thank Dr. Hewlett again for the wonderful talk. Thank you. So I'll, I'll see everybody uh, thank in you very a couple much. of hours. Thanks a lot. See you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Hello, can you hear me?
Okay. Uh, so, um, no? Okay. Uh, I'm Kilvia Farias from the Atomic uh, Physics Laboratory in this institute. And I was uh, studying um, sodium and potassium in nowadays. And now you have the second uh, uh, lecture of this nice school. And uh, just remember people online, please let your questions on the chat, please. Okay, now uh, I'm uh, the honor to introduce Professor Mark Reisman. Uh, he is the leader of the group of of experimental atom optics in the University of Texas in, at Austin, where he's uh, obtained his PhD in 1989. Okay? He has a lot of interest in, gener in generation of scalable uh, quantum entanglement, comprehensive control of atomic and molecular motion, trapping and atomic hydrogen isotopes, uh, app applications to new uh, materials and processes, and optical trapping and cooling of glass uh, microspheres. Today, uh, he uh, will be the first uh, lecture of two, and he will talking about Maxwell's uh, demo, one-way walls and cooling of atoms. Please, Professor, thank you. Thank you, thank you a lot. Well, thank you very much. Um, and it's a pleasure to be there virtually. I, I wish I could be there in person. Um, I've had many excellent visits to Sao Carlos in the past, and uh, but at least I can tell you from remote. And so today I'm going to start uh, a discussion which will continue tomorrow. But the theme which which I'll show is crucial to everything is Maxwell's demon. And, and this is um, something that is, fits into a long tradition in, in physics, which is known as a thought experiment. Thought experiments are ideas that are proposed by usually by famous physicists. Uh, those are the ones that we value. And uh, they leave it to us as a challenge for the future. Uh, probably you're most familiar with Max, uh, with uh, Schrodinger's cat. So, and uh, proposed by Erwin Schrodinger. Of course, you you know that thought experiment uh, had ima imagined that you have a macroscopic object like the cat inside a box and you have some radioactive isotope that can decay. And when it decays, it triggers a, a little uh, hammer that breaks a vial of poison gas, which kills the cat. And so, but until you open the box, the, the, the cat is in a superposition of being alive or dead. And these sort of experiments, thought experiments rather, um, stimulate both a lot of theoretical discussion and also real experiments. But it's interesting to ask, uh, can we actually make those thought experiments work? And I think that with regard to Schrodinger's cat, it's still not clear. I mean, so far we haven't actually done that, at least not the way that Erwin Schrodinger proposed. Uh, people have made very, very small cats if you say that a few atoms are a cat. Um, but that's like saying a few atoms is, uh, is a house. And so a cat is not a few atoms. And so I'm not sure that, that Schrodinger would agree. That's the key question maybe. Of course, we cannot go back and ask these people, do they agree that it's been done? But I, I would argue that Schrodinger's cat is still mostly a thought experiment. And, to, and people are trying, but we have not yet made truly macroscopic objects into superposition states. Um, the situation that I'm going to tell you about today is a different thought experiment, uh, probably just as famous as Schrodinger's cat, called Maxwell's demon. Uh, this was proposed by James Clerk Maxwell, 
in 1871. Maxwell arguably was one of the, if not the most famous scientist or physicist of all times. In fact, Albert Einstein saw him that way and he had a picture of Maxwell on his mantle uh, because Maxwell's great achievements were to unify electricity and magnetism and light into one framework known as Maxwell's equations. Uh, Maxwell uh, was born in Scotland in 1831 and died in 1879. He was only 48 years old. So he died very young. He died, sadly, of, of uh, stomach cancer, apparently. Um, but in that short life, he, he really changed science. Now, towards the end of his life, he became very interested in questions of thermodynamics, the second law, and statistical mechanics. And, and so he was concerned whether you could find a way to somehow break or violate the second law of thermodynamics. And he came up with this thought experiment. And uh, the, the picture that you typically see is, I'll draw it roughly here. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching this because it is a school. And I really uh, prefer to teach on a blackboard. But I can't use a blackboard remotely. So I'm using the next best thing, was, which is my document camera. Actually, at the university, I'm already teaching in person with a mask, but I'm at home right now, so I don't need a mask. Uh, but um, I'm doing the next best. thing. So this is uh, not a. Bouncing around. He didn't really, they didn't know the And he said, suppose Hi, everybody. You are so sorry. Hi, everybody. We have technical problems. So perhaps in some minutes, some seconds, you are back. <laughs> 